Good evening, I'm Jose Cardenas. Undocumented immigrants being dropped off in Arizona. We'll talk to an attorney and immigration advocacy groups about why this is happening and what is being done to help the people being brought to our state. Plus, in Sounds of Cultura, SOC, the sounds of the Fiesta Mexicana Dance Company. And get to know someone making dental care services affordable for the community. All this coming up straight ahead on Horizonte. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you for joining us. Hundreds of undocumented immigrants detained as far away as Texas loaded up on buses and dropped off here in the Valley. According to ICE and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, federal officials bust hundreds of undocumented immigrants from South Texas to Arizona, many of them families, most of them from Central America. ICE says a recent surge in undocumented immigrants on the South Texas border is why they were sent here for help processing paperwork. Here tonight to talk about this is Cindy Whitmore, a volunteer with the Phoenix Restoration Project, Laura Elardo, co-founder of the group No More Deaths, and Regina Jeffries, a Phoenix immigration attorney with Guerrero Jeffries Law Group. Thank you all for joining us on Horizonte. I, I, I think what I want to focus on during this segment is dispelling a, a, a lot of myths, having talked to you all off camera. and, and uh, though first, Regina, tell us what's going on right now. Uh, why, why are we getting all these people coming from Texas to Arizona? Right. Well, what you're saying is uh, we're having uh, unaccompanied minor children. You're also having families, but individuals essentially crossing uh, the border into Texas. And what's happened is Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement don't have the capacity in Texas to deal with the increase, uh, the increase in numbers of people crossing. And so what's happened is instead of trying to find places in Texas or to detain these families in Texas, what's been happening is that ICE has been transferring individuals to Arizona where there's greater capacity. Um, there's greater capacity to process individuals because Arizona previously had been uh, the gateway for you know, the largest number of migrants coming into the U.S. So many of the resources were focused here. So uh, I take it myth number one is is the suggestion that somehow this is political retaliation by the Obama administration against the Brewer administration. Yeah, I mean absolutely not. I mean if you look at the if you look at the facts, I mean they they tell a different story. I mean the issue really is that there's not a capacity to handle this this influx in Texas, and so what Customs and Border Protection is doing is the humane thing in trying to get people uh, to a place where they can be reunited with family or placed uh, with the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the case of unaccompanied minor children. So Cindy, um, in terms of impact on Arizona, anybody in Arizona, your group was one of the first that was impacted because you were dealing with the families that were coming in. Tell us about what was going on there. Um, well, you know, we were we were definitely caught off guard. We weren't prepared um, to to provide direct aid to families, but I think uh, within 24 hours we had recovered. We received a re phenomenal response from the Phoenix community, and and my response to anybody who um, who would insinuate that it was a burden on our community, um, clearly it was not. We we had ample resources to share. I, I had more donations than I I knew what to do with. We. We couldn't even store them all. And, and we what were you doing away. for the people who were coming in? Um, we were providing, um, our, our primary goal is to provide phone support and help people make contact with their loved ones uh, so that they can make travel arrangements. Most of the time when people are released at the Greyhound station, they don't have confirmation numbers for bus tickets. So unless they have a phone and to make a phone call, then they're kind of stuck at Greyhound. Um, and and that's, that's the work that we've been doing at the Greyhound for the last two years. Now, Laura, I realize your group is focused more on, on the perils of crossing the desert, what's happening to those people, and we want to talk about that later in, the, in this segment. But uh, talk to us about the unaccompanied minors, which is a group distinct from the one that Cindy just talked about. Well, I think um, what we're seeing in w within our organization, within the volunteers that we see when we um, provide the direct aid um, to the migrants in the desert, um, the, the perils that we find with unaccompanied minors are um, their risk of abuse is, is, is high. Uh, they're crossing the desert, um, very dangerous trek um, for anyone, not, not alone um, a, a young child you know, or a teenager. Um, most of those that are coming across, we worry about them, whether they're being trafficked or um, uh, sexual abuse by others in, within the group or from others you know, uh, just in the desert. So those are some of the some of the concerns we have with some of the unaccompanied minors that are that are coming through. Now, Regina, one of the other myths, as I understand it, is the suggestion that people are just being dumped in Arizona and and nothing's being done to 
either process them with respect to the immigration system or even to attend to their basic needs. What's actually going on? Yeah, that's right. Um, there, there has been a lot of talk about um, people just being sent out into the world. Um, what, in reality, what's happening is that, at least in the case of the adults, uh, the families that have been coming in, all of these individuals are in removal proceedings. The same thing goes for the unaccompanied minor children who are being processed through Nogales. Um, they're all being placed in a removal proceeding so that they can go in front of an immigration judge and make their case. Um, many people might have a claim to asylum. Uh, some of the children might have claims to special immigrant juvenile status. Some of these different uh, types of relief that are sometimes available, but many may not. Um, but it, it, they are being put into a legal process, so it's not just that people are being released willy-nilly. And as I understand it, some of them actually have a legal status that would permit them to remain here because of the country they're from. So um, in particular with Honduras, uh, there's something called temporary protected status, but you have to meet certain criteria um, in, in order to be able to have temporary protected status from Honduras. Um, that's not really what's happening for the individuals that are coming over. Some of the individuals, though, are being paroled into the U.S. It's called humanitarian parole, um, so that they can essentially be released um, to attend a removal proceeding so that they're not having to be detained. So essentially what Customs and Border Protection is doing is they're trying to take the humane route here and release families, not detain children and, and parents, and allow them to stay with family members um, you know, in the U.S. while they're going through a removal or deportation proceeding. Now, Laura, you talked a moment ago about the risks and dangers of crossing the border, uh, and, and yet why would people run those risks? Um, as I understand it, part of the problem is what's going on in their home countries. Yes, absolutely. And when we're talking about the Central Americans specifically, um, the, the violence, the level of violence um, within their country um, is so great that they are um, they would rather risk the small chance that something happened in their journey to the U.S. versus sure death or, 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 or harm in, or poverty in their country. And what kinds of dangers are they facing? In the desert? Well, in, in their home countries. In their home countries, well, they're facing, um, well, extreme poverty. The economic situation in all in El Salvador, Honduras, and, and Guatemala is, is awful. Uh, most of them are living, you know, in very, very poor, poor conditions uh, where they can barely feed themselves or feed their children. Um, unemployment is huge. And, and then, of course, the violence, there's gang violence, drug violence, gun violence. Um, and as I understand, El Salvador, is it El Salvador that has the highest murder rate of any country that's not it, at war? In, Hon in Honduras. Yeah. In Honduras. So that's part of the motivation Correct. for people coming here. Um, uh, uh, Cindy, the, the, the demographics, um, the suggestion is that, that the unaccompanied minors are, are babies or, or four or five years old, and, and, and I know there's some of those, but, but it's actually a, an older age group, isn't it? It, it is. Um, you know, there, there are, and I, I've spoken with consular officials who have gained entrance to the children's shelters, and, and they've indicated that there are a few children, you know, around six years of age, but that the vast majority of these children are 14 to 17 years old, and one of the things we have to keep in mind culturally, that a 14 to 17 year old is not really considered a child in some of these countries. And um, in, in terms of the predictability of what's happened, uh, I know the press has reported that there was a huge upsurge, and I understand that that, that is true to a certain degree, but, but you've indicated that, that it wasn't entirely unforeseen. No, it's, it's not. I mean, we've, we've seen that these numbers have been increasing for a while. You know, it, it's, it's been known that the violence is increasing, that the poverty is not getting better. It, you know, it, it, yes, there was definitely a surge, but it, it wasn't completely um, un unpredictable that, that we were going to see families um, and, and un you know, youth um, trying to make this journey because the conditions are just so terrible that people are, are having to take greater and greater risks just to survive. Regina, on, on the process questions that we touched on earlier, some of these people are, are being released and, and they are given um, effectively court appearance dates, uh, or at least they have to check in. What happens if they don't? Um, well, if you, if you don't appear in court and you're given a hearing date, you are essentially deported um, in your absence. So um, if somebody doesn't show up to court, then an order of removal will be entered against them. And uh, if they're found in the U.S., then they will be removed. So, 
And, and speaking of, of uh, deportation, that's not what's happening to the people who are being processed right now, is that right? No, um, and, and a lot of what we're hearing is, is the unaccompanied minor children being processed, and specifically in the, Noga in, in the Nogales area, the Nogales uh, facility. And what's happening is those children are actually meeting with uh, Department of Health and Human Services, and they're being screened, essentially, by different government agencies. And many of them will be placed with Office of Refugee Resettlement, um, for housing during their uh, their removal proceedings during their time in the U.S. or if they can be placed with family members who are in the U.S., they will be placed with family members. Now, uh, uh, going back to one question you touched on at, at the very beginning, um, Arizona is, is is a choice of location for the federal authorities because we have some capacity, but but surely there must be other places. Um, further east, for example, where these people could go, uh, why are they coming to Arizona? Right. I think that immediately, though, I, I, because what's happening here is there, there is this huge upsurge, and I think what, what's happening is Customs and Border Protection is trying to figure out the fastest and, and the best way to deal with this, this huge increase in numbers. And Arizona is, happens to be one place where there is that capacity that they can send individuals for processing. However, after processing, they may not stay in Arizona. They, they will likely be sent out to different parts of the U.S. where they might have family members in Oklahoma um, that they'll be sent out to Oklahoma to stay with family members or um, to Boston. I mean, there, there are any number of places that they could end up. They're not necessarily all going to stay in Arizona. And Cindy, how quickly were the people who, who the families who came to the Greyhound bus stations, how quickly were they sent on to other places where they might find family members? Well, our, our goal was to get um, was to get these individuals um, first medically stable. Um, they'd recently been in the desert and then been held in, in very inadequate conditions in Texas. So, you know, we were seeing severe dehydration, um, you know, kids with asthma that were released that didn't have their inhalers returned to them. So as soon as we got people medically stable, it was our goal to get them on their way as quickly as possible. To, I am not aware of any of the families that our organization provided aid to in the during those 10 days that stayed in Arizona. Um, none of them were looking to stay here. They were all very anxious to be reunited with loved ones in other parts of the country. And after those 10 days, this is the first 10 days of the program, ha have you had any more families coming through? We haven't seen any new families released in, at the Phoenix Greyhound since Thursday. Laura, um, one of the things we've talked about is, is what seems to be some improvements in the way that the federal government is dealing uh, with immigrants, uh, both in terms of crossing the border, and, and Regina, I want to come back to you on, on, on some of this, but um, uh, there was a recent change in internal affairs for, I think, uh, Customs and, and, and Border Protection. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I can't give you specifics on on why um, he was he was released he was released of his duties. Uh, it was uh, the CBP Internal Affairs Director um, James Tomshek, and and um, what I can say is one of the things that No More Deaths has done is um, monitor the the. Um, U.S. involvement in the border, and we had released a report in 2011, the Culture of Cruelty report, which had shown systemic um, abuse by Border Patrol agents of migrants, um, countless, countless um, stories of migrants being um, horribly abused and violated by, by um, Border Patrol agents, where the response by Border Patrol was that it was a um, individual Border Patrol agent who did these. It was not a systemic problem. And I think what happened this week um, is the real recognition that there has been some systemic abuse and no accountability for um, any of these, um, many of these, any of these incidents. Um, 22 um, immigrants were have been killed or, or and, and murdered by Border Patrol agents with very little accountability, um, no arrests, and no and no none of them have been sent to trial. And then recently there was a um, discussion about a new change in use of force policies. That I'm not, I'm not aware of. Um, uh, there has been a discussion of, use of change of use of force. The CBP did not respond by, by putting, to, putting out a policy change. They did not react by, um, um, by creating any sort of a change of policy. It's still like business as usual. Uh, Regina, though, in that regard, though, you've seen some improvement in terms of how um, the federal government, ICE and so forth, is, is dealing with this current situation. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at, um, for example, um, enforcement and removal operations or um, certain parts of Customs and Border Protection, I think what we've seen over the last couple of years really is an increase in discretion. Um, so more, an, a greater ability for officials to look at an individual's circumstances. 
Um, so in the past where you may have had a, a mother with a small child who's a single mother detained for six to eight months in an immigration detention center um, with no one really to care for her child, um, those are the kinds of things that we're seeing more flexibility on with, uh, with, uh, with enforcement and removal operations, IAS Customs and Border Protection. Um, they're, they're much more able to take into account an individual's circumstances. So some improvement in, in how things are going, but still a lot more to do, I take it, would be the consensus? Yeah, definitely. Thank you all for joining us on Orizonte to talk about this very important and, and controversial topic, but uh, I hope we've cleared up some of the myths surrounding it. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Fiesta Mexicana Dance Company has been in the Valley for almost 20 years. The company is the official dance group for the city of Phoenix. In Sounds of Cultura, SOC producer Yahira Jaquez and videographer Juan Magaña give us an inside look at what it's like to be a part of the company. Our dance company is called Fiesta Mexicana Dance Company. It, it's helped me a lot, drastically. We have uh, dances from all, all over Mexico and every region is different and has their own unique style in the footwork, in the costumes. And then of course we have all the Latin American countries. We have Central America and we have South America. We want to educate our community and our audiences and say that, wow, if we see uh, influences of, of Africa, or Asia, and then the community sees, well, you know what, there's more to the Hispanic culture than what we usually think. We try to be as professional as possible so that when our artists are on stage, you can attract attention and say, wow, this is uh, in our community. These are kids that are our, our neighbors that are going to our schools. They're doing something very positive in the community. They're showing a part of a culture that maybe we don't know and we don't understand. Different generations that have been here many years, uh, still that's part of their culture. And they want to make sure that their kids um, continue and learn about their culture so that they don't lose touch with where they're from. This whole experience has changed my eyes from my perspectives and everything, and I really am proud from where I come from and all. We're also a nonprofit organization, and so uh, we don't ever close a door to anyone who really wants to be a part of this. A lot of the dance schools in the Valley are very expensive, so this gives uh, everyone a chance to be a part of something and try it at least. And if they see that it's not for them, but at least they try something that maybe they normally would not have had the chance to do. When you dedicate yourself fully, it's a lot of work. And some parents sometimes get frustrated because they think, oh no, you know, practice every day, and then we have performances every weekend. It, it, it's tough, it, it's tough on families. But as time goes on and they see how their kids change, maybe they're more outgoing, they're not as afraid, they're not as shy, they're not as timid. They, they realize that, that it, it is something very special in their kids. It's actually, it's hard, it's hard work. Like, I've done a lot of stuff and this is like one of the most hardest things I've done. I think that we can find out, you know, through dance, that we have much more in common than what we realize. Dr. Nicholas Porter is the founder and CEO of Risas Dental Embraces. He's making a difference in the Valley by doing what he can to help make dental services affordable for the community. Join us as we get to know Dr. Nicholas Porter. Dr. Porter, thank you for joining us on Horizonte. Thank you. Um, you've, you've been out of dental school since what, 2008? 2008, yeah. And you already have eight, seven or eight uh, establishments here in the Phoenix area? Well, there's uh, six here, two in, uh, I'm sorry, five here, and two in Denver right now. And as I understand it, one of your trademarks is that you provide bilingual services at all of your facilities. Yeah, we have about, uh, you know, 20 doctors, most of them speak Spanish, and about 95% of our team, uh, the teammates on the, on the, in each office speak Spanish as well. And why is that important to you and your business? Um, I just saw a big need, a big gap in service offered to Latinos, those, those that spoke Spanish, and I knew how important it was for them to be able to speak uh, their native tongue uh, in communicating their needs to 
uh, medical profession. I think sometimes uh, when there's translation that goes from some an assistant perhaps to the doctor, I think some things are lost in that translation. And so it's important that the doctors, everybody's able to communicate. But it's also we understand their, their culture. Um, having spent time down in Latin America, that's, that's one of the things that we're able to do. And uh, just to put an exclamation point, uh, the name of your dental practice is itself Spanish, Risas, Smile. Risas, yes, Risas. It was Grins, actually. And it was because the name was so hard uh, to say for many Latinos that I changed it to Risas. And so um, that's why I call myself Dr. Nicholas instead of Dr. Porter. It was so hard for many Latinos to say doc Dr. Porter, and so they would uh, call me Dr. Nico or Dr. Nicolas. And so that's what I'm known throughout the Hispanic community right now. And that's how you're known on the Spanish language radio show that you, you do. Tell us about that. Exactly. I have the, the El Show del Doctor Nicolás. It's a show that I've had now for about two years. And really all I wanted to do was be an accessible resource for people. Um, the Latin community especially, the Spanish speaking community. There's a lot of immigration talk on radio, but not too much in terms of dental health or health in general. And so I just wanted to be a an accessible and a transparent and on, honest resource for people to call in and get information and be educated on what the importance of dental health in, in their lives. And you've also emphasized affordability. Tell us how you do that. Well, there's, uh, there's some secret uh, sauce in all of that, obviously, but the, the main point was I grew up without much. And uh, one of the most important things in my life, when I went to have a root canal, actually, as a 12-year-old boy, um, and the, the lady at the front counter said, that'll be three fifty, And my mom looked at me and said, I, I hope she means $3.50. You know, and so it just the cost of uh, dentistry, in all honesty, has, has gotten a little bit out of control. And it's just been my desire to lower it. And so there are some things that we do to be able to help share costs by having three dentists in each of the centers and an orthodontist and so we we share all the costs under one roof and really at the end of the day it's a choice we make a choice to charge less and it's not just charging less though you do a lot of, of free charity work hundreds exactly. of thousands of dollars as I understand yeah we are approaching uh, three years old and we've given away probably more than a million dollars a lot of that is through my radio show we do a monthly makeover for people that write in letters and explain you know, their situation, what they're going through, their dental needs, and, and I select people and uh, call them, and then they come in and they get anywhere from five to $7,000 in dental treatment done uh, at no cost to them. In addition to that, every time we open an office, we open our doors for four hours that first day. At our grand opening, we have a, a little fiesta, and we uh, do free uh, dentistry, to as many people that, that come and as many people that we can see. Usually it's around 100 patients that come. And uh, it's about $40,000 roughly each time we open an office that we're giving away to the community in, in dental services. Additionally, we, uh, we have something we call Labor of Love Day. Every Labor Day, it's also the anniversary of the company. We open every one of our offices and uh, uh, we do four hours of free dentistry and then we have a little uh, anniversary party after as a, as a company. And so in those days, we, each office, it's my goal that each office gives away about $100,000 per office per year um, to give back to the community. And, and really, it's one day for us to give back to the communities that give to us every other day of the year. Dr. Porter, one last topic I want to cover quickly. Uh, that has to do with some concerns you have about what I think you refer to as hotel dentistry. Tell us about that. Well, um, we've had a few patients come in, and it's a real passion of mine to be able to reach out to the Latino company, Latino people, and help. And uh, patients that come in saying they were treated in a in a in a house or a hotel, and uh, they've had some some real issues. And it's a real issue that I would like to to bring more light on and understand, so that we can help these people understand they don't need to go to those places that they can afford. Uh, that they have a place that they can afford dentistry that has payment plans and ways to help them get their dental treatment without the need to go in and put themselves at danger. Well, it's in a, a safe and sanitary setting as well exactly. if they go to your office. Exactly, and that's the point.
And uh, what is happening? We have people, uh, dentists, coming from Mexico and setting up shop here on temporary Yeah, basis. usually that's what it is. They come here and they set up shop in a hotel or a house, and they send people out to to give flyers at a at a store. And this is yeah. something you're you're dealing with. This is something that, yes, I'm dealing with and trying and, to get more information. We may have you back on to talk more about this at greater length, but great. we're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us Thank on you. Something to talk about it. Yes. We end tonight's show on a light fashion note. Yesterday was National Seersucker Day, and Congress, several of whose members are pictured here, announced plans to reestablish its tradition of Seersucker Thursdays. We thought we'd do our part at least this once. That's our show for tonight. From all of us here at 8 and Horizonte, I'm Jose Cardenas. Have a good evening. Funding for Horizonte is made possible by contributions by the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station.